Hello everyone. So in this presentation, PBL will be explored through the presenter's specialized language training, SLT experience, as a positive teaching approach that emphasizes learner autonomy and applies the four C's of 21st century learning, which are creativity, collaboration, critical thinking, and communication, as well as the digital tools that can be used to help create meaningful real world learning. This is me, my name is Jen Artan. I am presently a continuing education instructor with Thames Valley District School Board, focusing on specialized language training. I work primarily with stage two learners who are hoping to get into the workplace, uh, either through our um, specialized language training for retail or for small business. I can be reached at Jen Artan on Twitter, which to be honest is the fastest way to get me. I am also one of the Tesla Ontario webinar managers I am the current Tesla Ontario Communications Chair and I think President-elect, but I'm not so sure about that right now. Um, I mean, I am, but it just might not be for another year. Uh, so that's how to get in touch with me. So if you need to contact me, I'll also provide an email at the end of uh, this presentation as well. So what am I going to talk about? Well, briefly, uh, because this isn't the point of this webinar, but I'll talk to you a little bit about what specialized language training is. Some, some specifics on the course that I teach, some theory or background to project-based learning, project-based learning with ESL learners, how to assess projects, because that is the big question. How do we give a mark to all of those skills that are so important? The group element, the individual element, uh, talk a little bit the, about the role of self-discovery, team building, reflection uh, on the assessment process, some sample projects with group activities, some pictures of PBLA in action, how PBL fits in with PBLA, and some educational technology tools. So given that this presentation is really only about 45 minutes to an hour, I will be touching on just a few of my favorite technology tools, including Padlet, Adobe Spark, Google Classroom, and Mindomo. So only a basic introduction if you want to learn more. Um, Definitely maybe see you at a conference that focuses on technology, such as the world famous Toronto Technology Conference coming up in winter of 2019 and every winter um, after that, I suppose. Okay. So these are my students. Uh, these pictures are fairly old and these students have given permission for me to use their pictures. But this is kind of what my classroom looks like. I have an element of hands-on inside every class that I teach. Some of our most powerful pedagogical theories and understandings of learning processes assume that knowledge is both created and validated in social context. So that's the key thing here. The key point is that learning happens in social context. Now, many of us have done blended learning where there's an element of individual work, but I think the, the biggest and the most meaningful learning impacts come when students are working together in a collaborative effort in class. Uh, even blended learning platforms tend to work best when students feel connected to each other. So does anybody know what these are? I've got a little story to tell you. Um, I began my ESL teaching experience in Istanbul, Turkey, many, many years ago. One day I went shopping with a student in a bazaar or market, and she was buying these Nazar Bonjuk in bead form, buying dozens of them. And by that point in my experience living in Turkey, I was familiar with them, and I commented to her that we didn't have these in Canada. I remember she stopped in her tracks, she stared at me in disbelief, and then she said, my God, what do you use? Teachers that use technology all the time can develop a strong connection to it. And when encountering colleagues who don't use technology might have the same reaction. My God, what do you use? I think it's important to note that learning still takes place. That technology is it's just a tool. And just like the other tools that we use, you know, the chalkboard, the smart board, notebooks, puzzles, games, etc. Having possession and knowledge of the tech doesn't automatically need so it doesn't automatically mean that we know how to use it effectively. That takes time. So doing projects with adult English language learners is a wise investment as it leads to multiple learning opportunities. And this is 
these are the essential functions of, of doing project-based learning. Uh, those of you who know me might get the joke on the top, right? But project-based learning essentially starts with a driving question or challenge. Maybe it's a food drive. Maybe it's finding out about a volunteer organization. Maybe it's finding out about um, fire safety in the community, right? Followed by, so what do students need to know about this project? What are the problems? What are the challenges? What do they need to know? This leads to inquiry and innovation. So now that they've identified the gap, how do they go forward? This is also connected to 21st century skills, which I will talk about momentarily. Project-based learning is about giving student voice and choice. This is student agency, learner autonomy. Feedback and revision. Projects have to take place in, in, a, in a series of steps. It's not all one fell swoop, but there's pieces. There's the pre-planning, there's the planning, there's the actual doing of the project, there's, there's reflection, there's um, peer review. And project-based learning should involve some component of a publicly presented project. If I were to ask you, and I've asked this in presentations before, I'm always, always amazed by what teachers have been doing as far as projects actually go with their adult English language learners. So what projects have you done with your learners? I know Christina, who is one of my colleagues, just recently completed an anti-smoking campaign with her uh, lower level, lower stage learners. They all produced these amazing pamphlets on the uh, benefits and, and the benefits, <laughs> the, the problems that are um, one can encounter if one smokes. So it's an anti-smoking campaign. So it was a really interesting project that she did. Uh, I've also heard from other people such as Cloudy, who has done um, uh, food bank drives every year, has done information related to Remembrance Day, uh, Thanksgiving, major holidays, and many, many other projects. And hopefully I'll be able to get a chance to talk to some of these teachers um, about their experiences. So project-based learning is a teaching method in which students gain knowledge and skills by working for an extended period of time to investigate and respond to an authentic, engaging, and complex question, problem, or challenge. So some of the key words here are that it's uh, investigate, authentic, engaging, and complex. PDL is solidly founded in theory, specifically experiential learning through the likes of David Kolb. All of these elements are important, but sometimes the most important point is left out. Reflection. It's in the deep reflections that students can isolate what they've learned, what changes there are in their thinking or language development. Reflection can't be an afterthought. If you're doing project-based learning, it's got to be built into it. The most learning comes from reflection. I can't emphasize that anymore. You want the students to get the most meaning out of any learning that they do, get them to reflect. And they can reflect in a number of different ways. You can have them do a written reflection. You can have them record their reflection um, verbally, do a podcast reflection. They're, you know, the sky's the limit. Just get them to reflect. The benefits of project-based learning for our learners are numerous, right? The process required in project-based learning includes all that you see here. It includes discussion and negotiation and persuasion active listening skills, collaboration, creativity, planning, management, use of technology to facilitate, and presentation. All of these skills are so important to be able to develop if our learners are hoping to become successful in the Canadian culture and in the Canadian workplace. So Stephen Mintz in 2014 had this to say about project-based learning when he's talking about this, the concepts of grounded cognition and higher order thinking. Concepts grounded in real world experience or examples are much more likely to be retained than concepts expressed abstractly. Higher order thinking, deeper understanding is elicited when students are asked to apply concepts, synthesize information, make predictions, form generalizations, 
or evaluate interpretations. Then when they're asked to recall information. So if we want our students to learn, we've got to find a way to ground cognition and to engage those higher order thinking skills. You may be familiar with this, Bloom's taxonomy. Let me zoom in on it for you a little bit more. So Bloom's taxonomy lists the, the, the thinking skills from lower to higher order and identifying the lower order skills as knowledge, you know, being able to arrange, define, describe, duplicate, label, those sorts of things. It's all about recall, remembering previously learned information. Going up the chain a little bit, um, the further up you go, the higher order the skills are. Then we come to comprehension, demonstrating that you can't, you can do more than, sorry, just recall the information. You can comprehend it. You develop an understanding of the facts. So questions, you know, such as classify, convert, defend, describe, discuss, distinguish, rewrite, summarize, translate. Application. So getting learners to apply something that they've been learning is progressing up the skill or up the, the ladder or light bulb in this case of higher order skills. And it includes such things as apply, change, choose, compute, demonstrate, discover, dramatize, employ, illustrate, interpret, solve, sketch, show. Analysis, synthesis, and evaluation. So these, again, this is the apex. These are the, uh, this is the apex. <laughs> this, this is the apex of higher order thinking skills. So project-based learning is actually, um, it, it probably uses all of these skills doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with just uh, the lower order skills. It's, the point is that meaningful learning and real learning occurs when the learners are able to anal uh, analyze, evaluate, and create with the knowledge that they've been given, interact meaningful, meaningfully with, with the materials. This is an interesting image that attempts to put different technological tools on a different level of the higher order thinking skills. So there are tools that you can use if you just want simply recall and retention. There's tools that you can use to help you comprehend information, such as maybe Quizlet. There are tools that you can use to create, analyze, and synthesize, uh, collaborate. So lots of interesting tools in this wheel. Just so you can take a moment and pause it. And I'll maybe try to stretch it out a little bit, make it a bit bigger so you can see it. Tools here. It's interesting how quickly tools uh, change as well. Some of these I can see have uh, definitely changed over the years. So what is the driving question of the project? Is it Canadian citizenship? Is it employment? Create a handbook for something in the community. Customer service, AODA, uh, AODA standards, health and safety training, volunteering in the community, small business, household or emergency plans or kits. What is a driving question? At the beginning of any product, <laughs> itchy nose, try this again. At the beginning of any project, there needs to be a process to determine what students already know, what they're interested in learning, and what they need to know. So a common method of tracking this is called the uh, KWL. And not that you need technology in order to, to be able to graphically organize thinking, but if you wanted to use technology, there are so many tools available. Mindomo is a good free tool. And mindomo.com can actually be set up for groups and projects for students to graphically organize ideas and thoughts. So teacher can set up a number of group accounts and students can brainstorm all in one space. So again, that tool is called mindomo.com. I think I have an example of that coming up. Oops. Yes, so like I said, one such brainstorming tool is Mindomo. So teachers can create a classroom account free and set the learners up so that they work on the same mind mapping task. So this just shows you a little bit about what the user interface looks like in Mindomo. It is fairly simple to use. It does take a little time to get used to playing around with it, but you can create a project, 
and you can uh, add users and, and share and determine what kind of brainstorm you want students to be able to do. If you want more information about any of these tools, I've created a PD or professional development Google Classroom. So all you have to do, uh, I think you still need a Google account. So if you don't already have a Google account, uh, what are you waiting for? So get a Google account, and then you're gonna Google Google Classroom. You're gonna click where it says join class, and then it's going to ask you for a code. So the code that you're gonna provide in order to jo join my class is this code right here. Small case, I4VTAE. So if you join this Google Classroom, you will have access to this presentation and other presentations I've delivered on various different uh, types of technology. Um, have I done anything not related to technology? No, I guess not. So this is where I keep most of my professional development resources. So join us there to get more details on these tools. This is an example of Mindomo helping me to map a Google choose your own adventure story I once created for my retail class. So everyone's familiar with the concept of a choose your own adventure story. Uh, writing it is a bit of a chaotic event, but it's, you know, because it's all, you know, choose A, B, A, B, C, and then you have to create these pathways. So the more choices you have, the more complicated the pathways could be. So if you were like me, a young child in the 1980s or 90s, whenever, uh, choose your own adventure stories came out. I used to read these all the time. I love the idea that I was controlling the story. I was making it happen. So if you're looking for a tool that can help you to organize and plan one particular choose your own adventure story, then think about using Mindomo. Okay, so again, another useful organizational tool that I use for multiple purposes is Padlet. Padlet now has what's called a shelf feature. So you can actually create a Padlet that encourages students to share what they know, what they want to know, and what they've learned, all in a specific uh, drop-down list. And it would be fairly simple to do. It would look like this. Know, want to know what I learned. And then it's simply a matter of the student selecting the little plus sign and entering their information here. This is an example of Padlet. Uh, this isn't the same feature that I just showed, but it just kind of shows how easy it is for students to use. It's just a matter of clicking on the plus sign. And this is organized a little bit differently than the, the drop down categories, which I actually I like that a little bit better. So students can kind of organize themselves. This is more a free form. They click anywhere on the screen and then they can give some information here. Another project presentation tool that I really happen to think works well most of the time is Adobe Spark. And Adobe Spark is a free tool that students can use to produce short videos and other presentations. So I've given some examples of using Adobe Spark. So I will pause the video and insert the Adobe Spark videos directly into this webinar so you can see how the students are using these videos. So while I've been talking about PBL, project-based learning, you've heard me reference 21st century skills. So what exactly are we talking about when we're talking about 21st century skills? What do I mean? Um, the moniker is a little uh, off and some people resent the fact that we're just calling these 21st century skills uh, and you know, referring possibly to the fact that they weren't used prior to the 21st century when they were, but that's the name we've got. 21st century skills are as follows. So the Conference Board of Canada. A few years ago, um, a bunch of people got together <laughs> to identify what are the most highly qualified skills for success in the Canadian workplace today. And those skills, the top ten, seven list of skills include the following. Creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurship as number one. Critical thinking, collaboration, communication, character, culture and ethical citizenship, computer and digital technologies. And it's interesting to say um, computer and digital technologies, they're just assumed 
now. So if your students don't have computer and digital technologies as, as a skill, it's definitely something that we need to help develop because otherwise they will be left out. Because ICT, Internet and Communication Technology, is seen to be inherent in all the other competencies. Lots of the letter C going on here. Here is a short video outlining what 21st century skills are in a slightly different way. I'll give you the link or insert the video directly into this webinar for you to view. century skills then involve critical thinking and problem solving. These are those higher order thinking skills that we were talking about before. Innovation, creativity, entrepreneurship, communication, collaboration, teamwork, growth, mindset. You might have heard this term being brandied about, especially in K-12, but having a growth mindset is, as opposed to a fixed mindset, is the idea that as adult learners, we're always learning. Life is continuously learning and continuously improving ourselves. Metacognition, learning to learn, persevere, resilience, what happens when things don't work out? Do we curl up in a fetal position and, you know, cry? <laughs> or do we keep moving forward? Local, global, and digital citizenship. So learner autonomy is about giving choice where choice is possible. So within my specialized language training classroom, there are certain things that uh, if we're talking about retail and customer service, as the expert in the field, I know what students need to know in order to become successful. But there has to be a way to enable the learners to, to choose to look at a certain topic or, or theme or something um, that, that's driven by them, by, driven by their own needs. So, and this is what is important here. Students who are able to choose the topic or focus of their projects are more likely to be engaged in it. And there's lots of evidence and research on this topic here. One of the benefits of project-based learning is the community building, is the teamwork, is the working together. So I know that we all have our special classes, but it seems I've been lucky in that so many of my classes, my students are able to develop this, this strong network that leads them into different areas of, of life, my students often go on to co-op and through Thames Valley District School Board's adult education at Weeble. So these networks of, of learners and users um, 
they continue to work together to be successful in high school credit classes. That's happening right now with my uh, group of business students as they're going through the co-op um, process. They work together, they study, they communicate, and they are successful. And it's because they, are, they have been part of a group and they're carrying on that tradition uh, outside of my classroom. So this is an interesting quote. I'm just going to, I'm not going to read it to you, but I'll, I'll pause for a moment and allow you to take it in. I love this picture here. I mean, who hasn't blindfolded their students and led them outside in a leadership activity? It was so much fun. So again, the focus is on how we build teams, right? Building teams takes time. And I always start off small because I want to see how my students are working together, how they are when we play games, how they are doing certain projects, because I know that eventually they're going to be working together on a fairly large project. So I need to be able to gauge, do they know what it means to work in a team? So I do these mini projects or short activities as a test run just to see how they're working together. Now, I think it's important to say, um, to not assume that students know how to effectively work in groups because they don't. Uh, we don't always know how to effectively work in groups. So there has to be some learning of, of what it takes to be a successful team. There has to be some understanding and acknowledgement that we come from these different backgrounds and have different prior learning, different cultures, and how important it is to respect ideas and beliefs. And also, it should be noted that we all have different skills and abilities that we bring to the team. <clears throat> some people have better language skills, better communication skills. As you know, a CLB 6 in speaking varies considerably amongst the learners. So learners themselves are going to be maybe all over the board. So it's important to know that, you know, we're not all exactly the same and we can all learn from each other. So yeah, sometimes there are problems working in teams and it's important to iron those issues out uh, so that we do have some successful, successful activities later on. This was one of my Home Depot classes many years ago. And this group was creating a project. They actually built a functioning lamp. So uh, very useful. And this group here was talking about safe loading procedures for Home Depot. I had them strap a bunch of Jenga blocks to some toy trucks and talk about uh, loading techniques. This group here is actually mapping out a retail outlet of Home Depot. And, and uh, I always like using blocks as, as a kinesthetic or tactile learning device uh, in my classrooms. If you don't have blocks, Cuisinaire rods, Jenga blocks, find them secondhand, useful tool. So like I said, we all have been in the position of being in a team that isn't functioning 100% effectively because sometimes there are problems. Now, sometimes, not sometimes, probably all the time, if you're in a PD activity, and they say, okay, we're gonna do group work now. And it isn't always a, yay, let's do group work. It can be groan, moan, group work. So in order to make the task and make the um, group activity a little bit more effective, here are some things you can do. This was developed by Carnegie Mellon University, solve a teaching problem. It's important that the task is defined, that students know without a doubt exactly what they need to do and they know the steps required to accomplish the goal. And within the project, it's important that students can assign roles. Not everybody is going to be doing exactly the same thing. And I also mentioned the students all come to the project with different backgrounds, different prior learning, knowledge, skills, and abilities. So make use of it. If your project involves in any way some kind of budget, like I had the uh, Home Depot group once developed a courtyard for uh, for Weevil, and part of it was to budget how much it would cost. If someone's got a background in accounting, make that their role. Um, so if someone has a background in accounting, make that their role. Make that something that they can shine through as the expert, and this will definitely help the uh, help the task. 
Other problems can come about when uh, communication isn't always as clear as it is. So communication needs to be coordinated. There needs to be deadlines. So if you're doing a major project in the class, this is something that's going to take place over time. So there needs to be steps. There needs to be a series of, of deadlines for the brainstorming process, for the planning process, for the actual delivery of the project. So make sure you think about this um, ahead of time. I've already mentioned some educational tools that I find help with project uh, delivery, project planning. Mindomo helps for the planning. Padlet can help for brainstorming or for other ideas. Um, also, I've used ThingLink before. ThingLink allows students to create multimedia and um, add interactiveness to, to a web page. ThingLink is really a useful tool. This is a real basic version of ThingLink. This might be, um, I don't know, every, every time you click on one of the little dots, it opens up a video or image or more information about something. So you can have them defining, um, defining parts, of, parts of a store. You can have them, if it's um, an emergency plan, you can have you know, a picture of a house and each little button be different parts with different multimedia embedded into it. It's a really useful tool and it's a free account. The paid version, however, offers you the affordance of using um, 360 uh, panoramic visions, which are really kind of cool, but who can pay for stuff like that? So the free version gives you what you need and it's called ThingLink. You might have heard me earlier talking about how important feedback and revision is. And especially when we're talking about a project that is ongoing, it's so important to get that formative feedback in at regular intervals throughout the project. So this is interesting here. I'll read this part. Critical reflection when done regularly has been shown to increase learning retention. By making meaningful connections, the learners are able to recall and apply learning to other contexts. And again, critical reflection, uh, formative feedback. This has been researched ad nauseum by many, many people in education. Uh, for more information, you can look at some of the references and resources I provide at the end of this presentation. So how do we integrate? So how do we integrate reflection into a project? Well, we need to be able to take time to respond or to pose questions for the learners along the way. So map out the thought process of the project and graphic organizers, right? You can complete the final stage of a know, want to know, and learn to chart. And you can also have students maybe record a video log or podcast of aha learning moments that they've encountered throughout the project sort of a, I didn't know this, or this is something that surprised me, and just have them fill this out throughout, and then put it all together at the end. The other core components of project-based learning is that it be publicly presented in some way, even if it's just in the hallway of your school, inviting another class to participate, something that involves other people. So providing that opportunity to display the project and to interact with others in order to explain, defend, and discuss is key. The project that you see in front of you, well, there's a few of them. I can zoom in on it a little bit here. This project that you see in front of you is the small business project. So students were working together to create a small business idea here in London. So this was a jewelry store. This one was a pet store. So the project designers created a, a board and then they demonstrated everything that they've done, their business cards, their, their business plan, their website, and things like that. This is the Home Depot um, courtyard project where students actually made a model of the courtyard at our school and they redesigned it so that it would be useful because in its current state, it's not. So they prepared a budget, they put plants in there, they said what material they would be using, and then they presented this to the principal of the school and said, you know, hey, why wouldn't this be a great idea? Um, this, this, this group here is, is so messy, but they're, they're the group that won, so it's interesting, I'll zoom in on it. Uh, they had so much going on in here, they had a little waterfall, 
They had a, real, a Zen meditation area, and they had a monarch butterfly habitat along the back wall. So they had so many elements uh, in this project, and they won because it was something that appealed to the most people. Uh, this was a restaurant idea, and they showed their menu, their website, Wix.com, and that was all printed out. Their business cards, some market research that they did, and using Google Forms to compile. Uh, and which one is this one? Yeah, this is more of the pet store here. So I know a lot of you are saying, well, Jen, I like the idea of doing projects, but I'm kind of busy and I've got a lot of other things going on, especially with PBLA, Portfolio-Based Language Assessment. There's a, it's an assessment model that we're using. Anybody that's using ESL, or sorry, in ESL or LINK is familiar with what I'm talking about. But my, I say that you can do both. Projects can exist, coexist, really well within the PBLA framework because projects are about authentic real world tasks that are meaningful to the learners. So yeah, PBLA, PBL meet PBLA, PBLA based PBLA, which the acronym would then be PBLB PBLA. That's a mouthful, right? So the key terms in PBLA, learner autonomy, evidence-based progression, artifacts aligned with the CLB skills and competencies. All of this, like I said, can certainly be integrated into meaningful real world projects uh, designed by our students. So I will provide this video link or I might be able to download it directly into the uh, presentation. But this is a really good short video that outlines what uh, project-based learning standards and assessment actually mean. Because if you're doing project-based learning, the whole key or the whole important point is that we give formative assessment as well as, you know, maybe some summative assessment in there too. So how did you, you know, what can we, what marks, you know, because grades, grades are the currency with which we deal on a regular basis. So students are going to want to know, where's my artifact? Where's my um, speaking, writing, listening, reading? Uh, and so this talks a little bit about how you can integrate assessment in project-based learning. Yes, we have already discussed the importance of aligning our PBL units to our content standards and talked about how a good driving question will lead students to uncover the standards. One problem though that many teachers struggle with is how they should assess the standards within a PBL unit. With that in mind, I would like to borrow an analogy used by Andrew Miller, who is a leading national expert on project-based learning. He uses this analogy when discussing assessment within PBL. So, imagine you are window shopping as you stroll past shops downtown or past the stores in a mall. You might notice something you like. You might even go inside and try on a coat that caught your eye or a pair of shoes that you like. You might simply admire a new TV or computer that you really want to buy. That's window shopping, right? It's very different from shopping with intent. When you intend to purchase an item, a gift for a friend, or a new pair of shoes for yourself, the task is very deliberate. You go intending to buy something. You can use this analogy when talking about standards in project-based learning. There are some standards that you intend to buy. These are the standards you mean to teach and assess in the project. There are also some standards you window shop. These are standards you encounter and explore in the project but not standards you intend to fully assess. As a teacher, you should think about which standards your students will buy and how you will teach and assess those standards. So, once you have initially given thought to which standards your students are going to buy versus which standards they are simply going to window shop, you can begin the process of planning assessments for those standards within your PBL unit. But before we get to assessment, keep in mind that this analogy also works for the 21st century skills, or the four C's. That's communication, collaboration, creativity, and critical thinking. And these are the things we really want our students to learn. 
and it's not really feasible to assess every 21st century skill or all four C's in, in every project. And when you keep in mind that you should spend some time teaching anything you intend to assess, you should also think about which 21st century skills your students are going to buy and which they are going to window shop. Most PBL experts would argue that you should only assess one or two of the four C's in any given project. Now, after you know what standards and skills you intend to assess, you'll need to think about how you're going to assess them. So we have some recommendations regarding the assessment of content during your project. First, it's okay to use traditional assessments during the course of a project. Be sure to keep them short and focused on specific standards or skills and use them early on in the project as students are working to build knowledge of the content. But yes, short quizzes, homework, writing prompts, and similar types of assessments can still have a place in PBL. One thing you might think about is the use of mini presentations during the project for students to demonstrate their understanding of the content. This type of performance assessment is a great way for students to practice their presentation skills too. Although you should be sure that the student knows that they are being assessed on the content only and not the presentation itself for this type of task. Also, don't forget to include content in your summative assessment or project rubric. There is certainly a place in project rubrics for content as well as other skills and indicators. So in regards to formative assessments, the more you include throughout the project, the better you can expect your students to perform. This is what a lot of people call grading for learning or grading to inform. Students learn from these types of assessments that inform the student as much as the teacher. Formative assessments can come in many forms such as discussions, team meetings or check-ins and journals, exit tickets are an example, and there are many, many more. If you're interested in using formative assessments in your project, and you should be, just Google list of formative assessments and you'll find plenty of information. And keep in mind that formative assessments don't necessarily all deserve a grade in the gradebook. But if you need to record a grade, let students know that there will be other formative check-ins that allow them to improve their score. Well, when it comes to providing opportunities for growth and student improvement, we would certainly recommend that teachers provide a rubric or rubrics for their students. We hope that you'll consider using some of the rubrics in the SPS PBL Resource Library to aid you in assessing the four C's. These rubrics can all be modified to fit your needs, and many of them are now in Google Doc format. Another thing to consider is the use of self and peer assessments in PBL. These can be very powerful when done well. So think about using different feedback protocols and trimming down rubrics for self and peer evaluation so that assessments can be more focused, as can student plans for improvement. Finally, keep in mind that it's important to include both individual and group assessments in PBL. Think about the use of task lists and student journals coupled with individual student goal setting, as well as the use of individual check-ins and team contracts or charters when you consider how you might plan to hold individual students accountable for the project work. So, as we mentioned before, one of the mantras of PBL is that it is the main course and not just a dessert at the end of the unit. As educators in a PBL setting, we should seek to utilize different assessment strategies throughout the project and not just one at the end. Assessment done well in PBL seeks to inform students and help them to improve and will ultimately lead to higher quality student work. By now, you should have covered all of the essential design elements of Gold Standard PBL, but if you haven't, be sure to click on each of the different design elements to learn more. Also, check out the assessment map from the Buck Institute by clicking on the link below. And don't forget about those rubrics I mentioned before that can be found in the SBS PBL Resource Library. We recognize that assessment is a big topic, and that's why you're going to find more on assessment and PBL in Module 2, Implementing PBL. Be sure to check that out. Okay, once you've planned and mapped out your assessments, start thinking about your entry event. That's coming up next.
The most effective kind of feedback happens at the moment, verbally or written, most often verbally given the context, so that students have a chance to consider, reconsider, and then adapt. Giving feedback after a task has already been completed can be anticlimactic and very often ignored. Students want to see the, the grade. They want to see the currency. The, did they pass? Did they fail? What, what mark did they receive, et cetera? So feedback that's given formatively during the assessment is far more valuable to the learning process. Um, so this formative feedback is more for the teachers and the PBLA monitoring than the actual learner. So we need to think about who we're constructing the feedback for, right? We're constructing the feedback for the learner. So there needs to be a, a way or a method or a plan throughout the process where instructor and learner can sit face to face and, um, and, and give meaningful feedback and reflection. If you're watching this archived webinar as part of a uh, group PD at your site, I have a group challenge for you. So I want you to break off into teams. Yay, team activity, fantastic. Team one, your topic or your module is Canadian law. I want you to think of the following points. So if your students are working on Canadian law, what kind of driving question in a stage two group activity would your students, uh, would your students need to know? What do you think they already know about Canadian law? Right, and now this can be tricky because, you know, so many of our students have watched TV and they might misconstrue Canadian law with American law. We do that ourselves. I mean, have you ever heard a Canadian plead the fifth, right? That gets me every single time. Someone pleads the fifth. Well, the Fifth Amendment to the Canadian Constitution requires that uh, Parliament sit twice a year. It has nothing to do with not having to, not to being forced to incriminate yourself like the Americans uh, have. So Canadians who plead the fifth really need to take a, uh, a gander at the Canadian Constitution to see exactly what they're pleading uh, when they say that. Think about what kind of publicly presented project they might have, what possible assessment opportunities might the students have, and what kind of educational technology tools would be useful in a project on Canadian law. Well, here's an idea. Uh, marijuana, right? It just became law. So maybe students want to know what is the law all about? What does it mean? Um, things like uh, driving, un driving under the influence. Not a lot of Canadians actually know what the laws are related to marijuana use. So maybe this might be something that the students are able to do as like a public service announcement. Group two. You might be thinking about something like Canadian winter driving safety, because even if you're watching this in the middle of summer, you know it's coming. Winter will be here at some point and some point soon. So this could be done in either stage, I think stage two or stage one. What do students already know about winter in Canada? Now, for some of them, this is their first time in winter in Canada. So they have no idea what to expect. And it might be the very first time that any of them see snow or experience it. So what do they already know about Canadian winter and driving? So especially something like uh, driving in a blizzard and you get uh, in a whiteout condition, right? What do you do? Do you get out of your car and you try to make it to a home or do you stay put? What do students need to know? What kinds of projects could they have? What possible assessment opportunities? And what educational tools might be useful here? Another project might be related to volunteerism in Canada. And especially if you are teaching students or if you're doing any kind of module or specialized language training like I am on, on helping to integrate our learners into the Canadian workplace. Volunteering in Canada is such a good bridge. It has so many benefits uh, to the learners, not just for language development and getting references, but networking 
and developing their professional skills as well. So what kind of driving question would there be? What do students need to know? What do you think they already know about volunteering? And what kind of project would they have? What possible opportunities to assess? And what kinds of educational technology tools would be useful for a project in volunteerism? There are so many other projects you could consider. I really hope to hear back from many of you about other kinds of projects that you've done because those sorts of activities are the most meaningful activities. I can think back on my entire educational career as a student, as a teacher, the most meaningful learning activities for me have been when I've been involved in project-based learning. Thank you very much for attending this presentation. If you have any questions or any ideas, I strongly encourage you to contact me on Twitter, to send me an email, to give me your thoughts and ideas about developing project-based learning. Project-based learning is pedagogically sound. It fits in the PBLA. And yes, it can be a bit more work and a bit more challenging to assess. But I think we need to find a way to make it part of the learning experience. Thank you so much for your attention and time, and I hope to see you at future webinars produced and presented by TESOL Ontario. Here is access to another tool, and this tool has many other educational um, technologies that I've used with my learners before, so you can have a look here. All images, unless otherwise attributed, are CCO, free for public domain, no attribution required, care of www.pixabay.com.